This week, the US Senate impeachment proceedings plays it out on the global stage for a second time for a president who incited an insurrection. Five people died, many others now sustain long, lifelong injuries. And I think that what happened this week illustrates for us the Apostle Paul's writings in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7, that will be our scripture. It is a letter to the church in Corinth, and it's my focus on my sermon called Transfiguring These Temples of Pleasure. Listen as I read to you 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And here's the transfiguring part. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Note this all seems pretty simple. The world can't see what the believers can see. The world is all about ego and greed and power, self-serving interest, fed by narcissism, refuses to hold leaders accountable for immoral or unjust actions. Yeah, that's the world. It's blind because it lives in what the psalmist calls the valley of the shadow of death. There is no light in that valley. For Paul, the gospel is veiled and he keeps the world from seeing. So the question for today is what shall we do with this as people of faith who live in the light? So today, it not only is Valentine's Day, it is Transfiguration Sunday. And the lectionary scriptures focus on two stories of humans who were transfigured from physical to spiritual. So Elijah, the prophet, when rather than dying, he ascends into heaven in a spiritual form in a chariot while Elisha watches. That's in 2 Kings. The second story is of Jesus on the mountaintop with a few of his disciples who have a vision of Elijah and Moses in spiritual form now, having a conversation with Jesus who is in physical form. That's in Mark 9. Now, these passages are about the transition of physical to spiritual and spiritual to physical. So I'm going to suggest that we consider the Celtic understanding in the Celts of Ireland called thin places. Before Christianity, the ancient Celtic religion taught that there were thin places throughout the landscape where the spirits of the other world could easily transverse from one world to the other. So it was easy to move from an earthly life to a spirit life and back again. It suggested that's why Ireland was so easy to convert to Christianity. St. Columba and St. Patrick came to the island with a Christian story of a man who died, entered the spirit world, then returned to the physical world, only returned to the spirit world again. It all made perfect sense to them because they understood thin places. So in some ways, the Elijah story in 2 Kings and the Jesus story with the prophets in Mark are examples of thin places in the Christian understanding. Now I'm going to suggest that these stories have a point. They all connect to Elijah. And when the electionary committee put these together, for the same week, they were asking us to consider how the ministry of Jesus connects to the miraculous Elijah, who was the law proclaimer, and Moses, the law giver, and the law of Moses, according to Jesus, could be summarized in one word as love. So that's the transfiguration stories 
of the lectionary, but now they also included this passage in Corinth. And I haven't read verse seven yet. And then he writes, but we have, we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. So while he says that the world is veiled in its ignorance, and we have seen that this week, believers have a treasure and live in the light and we can see clearly. We understand and know that we are spiritually wired for love. It is God's mobilizing power in us, and it is not found in spiritualized state, but rather in our clay jars. We are in these clay vessels. We are not angelic beings returning from the other side of the earth to chat like Moses or Elijah. But just because the, the treasure is in these clay jars, Neither are we confined and limited to the understandings of this veiled world. A spiritual treasure is inside our physical existence. It is if Paul is describing something akin to the thin places at the spiritual level. We live with this tension. We see spiritual things that the physical world cannot see under its veil. Love requires justice. We know things the world does not know. Love is the answer. So now we're going to ask ourselves, are we the light in the shadows of a corrupt, hungry, wounded world? I'm not asking how shall we shine a light? Let's get our act together and come up with priorities for the year and mission priorities. No, I'm not asking that. I'm asking, are we the light? Or are we living under the veil to ourselves? You see, we don't shine the light. We are the light. Incarnation means God in the flesh. Jesus, God in the flesh. United Christian Church of Levittown, God in the flesh. You, God in the flesh, in your clay jar. Whoa, now it gets scary, doesn't it? And a little bit unbelievable, like, oh dear. Now, now we want to shrink back and say, who, uh, none. And we discount the treasure and focus only on the clay jar. Now, another writer helps us get at this. That's John in the second, first John, second chapter. And I'm going to change all the he's and him's of the God language to the word love. So we'll hear this passage differently. He writes, whoever says, I have come to know love, but does not obey love's commandment is a liar. And in such a person, the truth does not exist. But whoever obeys love's word, truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. By this, we may know that we are in love. Whoever says I abide in him, Jesus, ought to walk just like Jesus walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. I'm writing you a new, command, a new commandment that is true in love and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. It is only by living in love that we truly reflect our real human nature. And yet we look at these clay jars and we begin to doubt but not Paul. Paul glories in these clay jars, knowing that the spirit shines brightly through them. He sees treasures. Why don't we? We look at our clay jars, and unfortunately, too often, we see sin. And I think we're afraid. The poet Audre Lorde says, we have been raised to fear the yes within ourselves. 
our deepest cravings. And this fear keeps our feelings suspect so we cannot grow beyond whatever distortions we may find within ourselves. And then because we, we fear the yes in ourselves, it keeps us docile, loyal, obedient, externally defined, and leads us to accept oppression. We fear the yes in ourselves, our deepest cravings, she says. I think we fear our inadequacies. I think we fear our fleshly needs and desires. I think we fear the pleasures of life that our clay jars actually quite enjoy. But one poet writes that fear is the cheapest room in the house and I would like to see you living in better conditions. To this, to get out of that cheapest room in the house, we have to wake up to our transformed reality. Another poet says the only way one is awake is the only one who is awake is the one who has heard the flute. Our fears stifle the flute song. Legalism stifles the flute song. Perfectionism stifles the flute song. Oppression, injustice, the lies of the world stifle the music. And that is why the world cannot hear the flute. It is why it cannot see and hear behind the veil. So our views of our clay vessels are stunted. And the idea of living in these bodies has been distorted. Distorted by fears that keep us from living outrageously uh, as lives of love. How can we be doing any love mischief if we are afraid of our clay vessels? That's a key question here. What would happen if we woke each morning and asked God, what kind of love mischief shall we do today? So I'm going to turn to science because the creator has biologically hardwired us for love and compassion. None other than Charles Darwin said that the sympathy is our strongest instinct as a species. He writes, it is our capacity to feel compassion and mirror the feelings of our fellow human beings that has been a central element in our physical evolution. Compassion. And then more recently, researchers of the brain tell us that our compassionate response comes from a specific part of our brain called the anterior cingulated cortex, the ACC. And when this is compromised, we tend to be more aggressive, we are less emotionally evolved, and we're less able to mother our infants effectively. Now that's good news and bad news, but they've also discovered that compassion can be learned in that brain piece. So what they did is they wired the brains of monks who meditated regularly. And then they played various sounds of humans, including distressing sounds of humans, and observed what happened in the brain when these sounds played. And what they discovered is that those who meditated, that is those who were spiritually centered, had more brain activity in the compassion part of the brain. We have an area in our brain for love's purpose. And those who are plugged into their spirituality biologically respond in compassionate ways. Love is what is natural. Fear is what is taught by the world that is under the veil. The golden rule frees us to be fully human because we are made for compassion. 
Now, there is a modern idea akin to the Celtic thin places or the biblical idea of Elijah and Moses and Jesus talking from the spirit world to the earthly world and back again. Remember Star Trek, the transporter. It worked like the opposite of an elevator. Rather than people moving to a different location, they remain stationary in the transporter and then a new location moves to them. I suggest that the transport system of the spirit to the earth and back again is always to stand in the energy of love. Our job, like the transporter, our job is to stand still and let love do its work on us. It is to be open to the treasure in these clay jars. So speaking of our clay jars, Carter Haywood, one of my favorite Christian theologians says, if we can learn to trust our senses, to touch, taste, smell, hear, and see, then they can teach us what is good and what is bad, what is real and what is false. That sensuality is the foundation for our authority. This is incarnation, God in the flesh. We know Godness through our clay vessels. So I'm going to suggest that these clay jars that we may have some trouble with are actually temples of pleasure with the capacity to exude goodness and kindness and compassion. And these temples of pleasure in these clay vessels hold treasures. And in these temples, we move through a thin place that takes us to the very heart of God. Transformational possibilities happen when we live in the thin places between the spirit and the flesh. What happens is we begin to have love mischief and dancing because we're hearing the flute. We don't have to shine the light. The light shines through us. We don't have to rip the veil off anybody else when they hear the flute music calling them, they will dance and take off that veil themselves. Our high calling, my friends, is to be lovers to the world and who are still living under the veil. The flute is calling us to live love, to be love in all that we are in these bodies, these temples of pleasure. We trust in our goodness and we trust in the goodness that holds us fast in a love that will not let us go. Physical beings living in the heart of God, spiritual beings living in clay vessels that are temples of pleasure. The flute is playing the divine song of love everlasting. Love without beginning or end. Love that dares to do love mischief. That dares to dance as long as we have breath. It is in our bodies, these clay jar temples, that God is made manifest. First in Jesus' body. Now in his body. That is us. Jeremiah the prophet said, that when he found God's words, he ate them, and God's words became a joy and a delight to his heart. Transforming simple acts of eating and of drinking. Filling ourselves with love words. When we do these simple acts, each day, sometimes together, sometimes by ourselves. Like Jeremiah, we eat God's words. 
love one another. You are made for love. I will not abandon or forsake you. I will be your God. You will be my people. By their fruits, you shall know them. When we do this, we move into a thin place that connects us to God. Simple things like eating and drinking. And yet, it's eating and drinking at a physical level. Connecting to a God in the flesh. To live in love is to be transformed. We live and move and have our being in something far greater than ourselves. We need not look at our clay treasures with disparagement. Instead, let us look at the treasure that is inside. And let us leave energized by this treasure and the light of love spirit. And let us dance to the tune of the golden rule to treat others as we wish to be treated lovingly. And then let's you and I go make some love mischief today, my friend, for that is exactly what we are called to do on today, Valentine's Day. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.